the revelation from Jesus Christ, given to him by God to show his servants the events that must soon take place. Blessed are those who listen to this prophecy and take it to heart. For the time is near. These are the words of the one who is holy and true. These are the words of the one who is first and last. These are the words of the ruler of God's creation. These are the words of the Son of God. Well, thank you for joining us either here on campus or online. And as we begin this series, so the seven, look at the seven churches of Revelation from the first few chapters. We want to give you a little bit of a setting so you understand who is writing and how it was given and where these letters are coming from. And so we're going to start today's message with just a little bit of teaching about the churches and where they're at and where this letter was written from. So Revelation chapter 1, beginning with verse number 9, it says, I, John, was on the island of Patmos because the word of the God and the testimony of Jesus. So John is on the island of Patmos, and the island of Patmos, he was there because he was exiled. So every other apostle had been martyred for their faith except John. John lived a long life, but his, uh, the sentence given to him by the Roman government was sent to this island of Patmos. The island of Patmos is 63 miles from the land, and so this is a map. This is Greece, Athens you see here. This is modern-day Turkey, and it's 63 miles out from land, which doesn't seem terribly far for us today, but in the times of rowing a boat 63 miles, that's a long ways. So he was exiled to this island. Now, I used to think the island must have been like a Gilligan's Island with no trees. It's this little bitty berg, but it's not. It's actually a pretty good-sized place, and, and it's, it's spread out. There's areas to move around. There's a nice city there now. It's a port city. But still, it's a relatively small compared to the place of Turkey, Asia Minor, and Greece. But the thing about this sentence was he was exiled away from people. John, who had a passion, a love for Jesus, and wanted to share the word of God, was put to a place where he could not share it anymore. But in that place, it says that Jesus appeared to him on a Sunday morning. It says he was in the spirit. Jesus appeared to him and began speaking to him. Verse 11, Jesus said this, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, those churches are all what was called Asia Minor then. Today, it is Turkey. Let's see the map here. There we go. So the little P is where the island of Patmos is. So the first letter goes to Ephesus, and then it goes to Smyrna, Pergamon, and this is the order which was given in the book of Revelation in that way. Interesting, this is the postal route. Beginning at the seaport city, the postal route from old Roman roads was going around this way. So it was letters sent to the churches. There are seven of them. The number seven in the book of Revelation is a, a number of symbolic for whole, complete, perfect. So when these letters are sent to the seven churches, it's sent to the complete churches. They're specific to each one of them, but it's written to all the churches. It's written to us today, to churches still around so these letters were sent to them for a reason. Now, when these letters, you think about, they're just not a, a dear John letter. Hey, how you doing? Hope you're having a nice day. And they're not love letters either. These are letters which have a strong message from Jesus to the church. If you look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, begins the letter. He says, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are burnished bronze. So this is Jesus of revelation, Jesus of all authority, all authority over the church. When he's speaking to the church, he is the leader of the church. He is speaking with authority to each one of us, and we need to read these letters as in take heed, listen, this is God's word. And down in verse 7 of chapter 2, it says, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the prayer I want you to pray today, very simply, is God, help me to hear you today. He sent this letter to the church of Ephesus, the one we're going to look at, but that letter is also to the church of Harvester, and that letter is to each one of us as members of the church. So would you say, God, 
Help me hear you today. And let's respond to what he says. So we begin this book, Ephesians, or this, this letter, the book of Ephesians. Now I want to give you a picture of it. You know where it is on the map. It's that seaport city. But if you go to the, book of, or go to the city of Ephesians, it's Ephesus. It's this great excavation, incredible place. There's 250,000 people lived in the city this time. It's abandoned now. But you walk through the city, and our group from Harvester went a number of years back. You walk down this massive city. It's a seaport as well as it was a major highway running through. You get to the bottom of this road, and there's this magnificent library, which they've been able to rebuild the front of it from the ruins that are there. It's just an incredible city, just beautiful city. You walk throughout the city, you can see the, the temples. There's the massive temple to Artemis, the Greeks called it, the Romans called him Diana, the temple of Diana. It was a, the goddess of infertility. This is one of the seven wonders of the world, this huge, massive temple. There's also a temple to the emperor that was there as well. But you walk through the city and we go to the theater, and the theater in this city is very unique. It set 24,000 people. Huge, huge place. Again, for a large city, it's, but it's a massive size of this as it's been excavated and uncovered. Interesting, you can stand on the stage and the people clear out here can hear everything going on. The Romans were magnificent in how they built their theaters. Here's an aerial shot to get an idea of the size of this theater. It's a massive place. Acts chapter 18 tells about how Paul was in the, in the city. He was there for two years. Acts 19 says a riot was about to take place in the theater, and this is the very place where that riot was taking place, where Paul was at. But the city is magnificent. It's huge. This huge commercial city. It was an extreme pagan city with the temples that were there, but it's also a place where the church was at where the church was birthed. And we see the stories about Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla. Of course, Timothy was a pastor there for a long time, and John was a pastor there. The books of Acts address this city. Of course, the book of Ephesians was written to this church, as well as Revelation, and understanding that God had words to say to this church. And now Jesus is writing a specific letter to them that he wants us to hear as well. So here we go. Revelation chapter 2, beginning verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the golden lampstands. So Jesus is walking amongst the church. He's holding these seven stars, and these stars, he has authority over them. There's power in his right hand, and he says, I've set these up. It's probably referring to the pastor as the ones who are supposed to be leading the church. And he said, you follow me, and don't you go astray. But he's walking among these lampstands. The lampstands are the churches. The lampstand's job is to hold the lamp, to hold the light. And our job as a church is to hold up the light of Christ. Many times Jesus talks about being the light of the world. And our duty is to hold up the light of Jesus and his love so everyone that sees the church sees Jesus. And he's walking amongst them. So Jesus is walking amongst us today. It means he was walking amongst you and heard what you said out in the parking lot or heard you said when in the nursery or in the lobbies or you're walking through trying to find a place to see. He's here walking amongst us. He's walking amongst you there at your home, wherever you might be. In fact, he's walking amongst us all week long because we're the church wherever we go. And he's saying, are you holding up the light of Christ? Because that's what the duty of the church is about. Verse 2, it says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. These are good words. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, and you have tested those who claim to be the apostles, but are not, and have found them false. So the church of Ephesus, he's saying, you're doing well. I know the good deeds that you're doing in my name, and you're persevering in hard times. You're staying faithful what's going on, and you don't allow wickedness to develop within the church body. You don't allow people to become angry and spiteful and mean towards each other. You address that, and you don't allow false teaching to go on in the church. And I believe those words that he said to the church of Ephesus very much so fit his words to Harvester. Because we try to do these things. We're doing good works in his name. We're persevering in very difficult times. We don't allow wickedness, and we don't allow false teaching. Verse 3, he says, You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. So he repeats that. You're persevering again. He says, You are sticking with it. This church in Ephesus is an incredibly pagan, pagan city. And there was so much opposition. We see that in Acts 18 19. But this church just kept staying faithful. He commended them for that. It says, you've not grown weary. Last week we used the verse in Galatians 6, 9 that says, let us not become weary in doing well, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. 
It says, don't grow weary. You keep faithful to what he's called us to do. So he said good things. And I think it's important for us sometimes just to step back and just reflect on goodness. In this world, it's hard sometimes to see any good. And to be able to sit back and say, you know, in the midst of the whole world going absolutely crazy with anger and fighting, I'm thankful to be a part of a church body that is still holding up the light of Jesus. Amen? I'm thankful to be our church is still on focus. We're still doing good deeds in his name. We're still caring for people, like you said. And we're not going to get sidetracked by false teaching that says things that may be comforting and we like to hear. But we're going to stay true to God's word. So we need to reflect on that goodness. And uh, In the book of Ephesians, when Paul wrote them, he said, Don't forget that you were created for good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. And every one of us, as members of the church, were to do good and hold up his name, and to persevere no matter what. So he said good things about him. But in verse 4, it changes the letter. And here's Jesus, the God of Revelation, saying, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. You've forsaken what you said you're going to do. The ESV says you've abandoned the first love. So they're doing all the right things, but the original passion that they had for Jesus has died off, and they've shifted. Now they're doing something else. They're doing all the right things, so they look right on the outside. I mean, they had their good deeds. They had the right theology, but something shifted on the heart on the inside. Now, Back in 1964, the Righteous Brothers came out with a song, and most of us don't remember that song. However, you've probably heard it because it's been recorded over and over and over and over. You know what it is, don't you? It starts with, you know, the, okay, you got it already. Well, it's okay. Why don't you sing it with me? It says, you've lost that love and feeling. Come on home, sing, oh, that love and feeling. You know this. You've lost that love and feeling, and it's gone, gone, gone. Here it is. Yeah, you got the woes down. All right, yeah. Whoa. You know, when you, when you see those old recordings, I mean, people are dancing, they're smiling, and I think, well, you just sang Your love is all gone. That's depressing. That's sad. And that's a very, very poor paraphrase of this verse. So Jesus is saying to this church, you've lost your love. Not your love and feeling. You've lost your love. You're you're so in love with me and doing all those things. But now it's just gone, gone, gone. Here, what is it? Whoa. Yeah. They've drifted. The church. He says, your heart was so sold out, and now it's gone. And sometimes when you think about when you first became a believer, how sold out you were. When the people that first started this church, I mean, they gave everything for this church. They did all so much to try to get this church going, and you've jumped in, you've done your, done your part. And sometimes after you've been a Christian for a while, you just kind of, oh, well, kind of been there, done that. You get tired of it. You see negative, and your heart starts moving over here. And sometimes when your faith grows older, your heart can grow colder. And that's what's happened to this church. They've been around, they were still hanging in there, but their heart was not at the place where it used to be and where it should be. Their heart had grown cold. They had a heart issue. I got got a little prop here. So we've got a a block of ice. And the block of ice, can you see what's inside there? Something red. Guess. It's a heart. Yeah, not a real heart. Don't get too freaked out. Okay, so I got a heart inside this block of ice. And this heart, let it represent your heart. When you first became a believer, maybe, I don't know when you became a believer. It was young or older or middle age. Maybe it was when you were off at a conference and a camp and you were so turned on to Jesus. You were so excited by everything. And if you have to be honest, Jesus sitting right across the table from you would say the words he said to that church. You've lost that love that you had before. You're not nearly as excited as you used to be. You're not nearly so passionate as you were at one time. You were so sold out, so committed, and now you're not. You know, when you first become a believer and you're singing worship songs, oh, man, it just brings tears to your eyes. And you just love Jesus so much. You're so thankful for what he's done to us and done for us. And sometimes after we're a Christian long time, you just kind of sing the words. They just kind of come out, or you don't really feel like it, or... Sometimes you see young believers and they're singing these new songs and you actually become irritated with them. Like, uh, uh. What does that mean? It means you've lost your love for Jesus and your heart is cold. 
instead of warm and tender, it's just kind of all frozen up. It's hard. It's bitter. And instead of being in love with him, you're just frustrated and angry. And the church of Ephesus looked good. They were doing the right things, but their heart was gone. And he says to them, you need to remember your love. All this is good, but remember this. This is so important. What about your heart? What about where you're walking with God? Where's, where's that emotions? Where's your love for Jesus? Now, when I was young, I had, I had different passions. I had different loves. I, I loved, when I was young, loved model cars and model airplanes, putting them together. And then I got to a place where I, where I loved um, restoring furniture, taking this old wood that's all falling apart and restoring what it looked good. That was a fun discovery. I, I loved hiking and rappelling. We used to go rappelling and climbing. I loved doing that stuff. You know, and I, I had a real passion for Gene. Anything around Gene, I was just all about, and that love hasn't changed one bit over the years. Okay, she gives me a thumbs up. That's the right thing to say there. But sometimes after 10, 30 years, your loves drift. Your passions drift, and they change. What we used to be so passionate about, all of a sudden we find our heart is cold, and it's shifted, and it's not where it needs to be. And he says, would you remember your love? 1 Corinthians 13, it was, we call it the love chapter of the Bible, and we, it gives this whole description of love is patient, love is kind. We love that part, but it begins with these words in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but not have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. It means you can say all the right things. I mean, you can just get those words down right. You can just be passionate. You can be the most eloquent person. You got that speech polished. You can impress people at your work, wherever you go with, oh, I can say the right things. You can talk somebody into buying anything or talk yourself out of any trouble. But Jesus said, if you're not in love behind of it, he said to him, you're just a noisy gong. Verse two, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, what does it say? I am nothing. You can be the smartest person in the room. I mean, you've got all the degrees. You've passed the test. You are just a scholar out there. You know more than anybody else. Maybe you know more Bible than anybody else. I've been in Sunday school forever. I know the Bible. You're the critic of all critics. And he says, fine, you have all the knowledge that there is. But if you don't have love, Jesus said, it's nothing. It's all empty words. And how sad for some of us, as we've grown older in our faith, our heart has grown colder. Verse three, it says, if I give all I possess to the poor, well, you're generous. And I give my body to the hardship, you serve well, that I may boast for myself, but do not have love, what does it say? I gain nothing. So you can be serving, you can be doing a lot, you can be so impressive, people look at you and say, wow, look at everything that you have, wow, you are a, you're a martyr for the faith, you serve, all those things that look so impressive out there, but what's going on on the inside? And Jesus said, love, it needs to be there. Don't forget our love for Jesus, don't forget where, is your heart turned cold towards God? You look around our world and there's, you don't see a whole lot of love like Jesus going on even from the people that say they're Christians, they're followers of Jesus. Tomorrow's Martin Luther King Day, a time we should stop and remember some horrors of our past and the lessons that were learned. And I appreciate one of the quotes that he says. He said so many great things. He said, I've decided to stick with love that hate is too great a burden to bear. You think about history, what he faced and what he went through, all the hatred, all the stuff that was thrown at him, but his response was to Love. It's an admirable, it's an amazing trait. I wonder what Mr. King would say to our government leaders today. They need to stand for love and not for hate. We, what we watched a week ago when the people stormed the Capitol was not a demonstration of love, but it was anger and hate. And one of the saddest things to me to see in some of those pictures was people carrying signs that had Jesus on there. This is, we're coming after you, after you with Jesus. That is, that is so blasphemous to the name of Jesus. And Christians are wearing this name, and we say we're Christians, we're following him, but we don't love like Jesus at all. And Jesus, he, he spoke for love. And too many times people who don't know Jesus look at Christians or people who say they are, and they look at their behavior and they say, I don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. And sometimes the church 
We may do good deeds, but our heart is so missing the point. See, the Jesus of the Bible is, is a Jesus who loved others first and foremost. Jesus of the Bible is the one who honored people, even the people who he didn't agree with. The Jesus of the Bible never used power and authority and anger in what he was doing. The only time we see him do that was when he was in the temple itself, and basically within the church because the believers and what they were doing. But as you reach out to the world, we don't see him fighting and throwing, but we see him living sacrificial love to the point that he went to the cross for us. And that's the kind of Jesus we should be following. That's the kind of Jesus our heart should be shaped after. Not a heart of hatred and bitterness and fighting and retaliation, but a heart of love. Again, amen? amen. So where are we at? Jesus sits across the table from you. Does he say, return to your love? Remember that love where it's gonna be there? Verse five, he says this. Yet I, verse five, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. It says repent. The word repent means to turn around. And it literally, he describes what that word, repent, do the things you did at first. So stop, go in this direction. Just stop, realize, and say, how do I do this? What do I need to do differently? How do I need to go back? You know, sometimes I, we, we turn from God intentionally to walk away, but many times I think we just drift. We don't intentionally walk away from him. We just find ourselves listening more to the world than we listen to Jesus. We find ourselves responding to things of the world to Jesus. Where we're so in love with him, all of a sudden now we start loving the things of the world, and pretty soon our, our heart and our love is for those things more than it is for Jesus. And we just stop and reflect and remember Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day. And we've given the staff the day off and we've asked them to take the day to remember and to reflect and to pray and to learn and, and do something, serve. It's a day for us to make sure we're, our hearts are right and we're not following in the sin of racism and do some reconciliation and care for others. It's also a time we just need to remember our heart and say, are we going to follow love instead of hate? And we're going to uh, go over and we invite you to join us between 11 and 2 at our, the campus over in Ferguson just to take time to pray for the future work there and for the city and what's going on. And, but I ask you to take some time tomorrow just to remember and just look at your heart. Say, am I following love or am I walking away from? You know, my relationship with Jesus, is it full of passion or is it just kind of locked up? And we need to make some decisions. I'm going to repent. I'm going to consider how far things are going. So instead of this, I need to repent of this drifting. I need to repent of drifting away from God and say, God, I'm going to go back to you. And we just need to say, God, I'm just going to chip off this chunk of ice all around my heart and just decide. Instead of just doing what I want, say, well, that's just how it is, intentionally say, no, I'm not going to stand for this hatred in my life anymore. And I want to walk away, walk away from those things and walk towards Jesus. And it means I need to spend some time with Jesus. I need to listen to his words. And this week, wherever you're on your Bible reading, maybe you just need to go to the Gospels and listen to the words of Jesus and hear those over and over and, and shut the media off for the while, shut the news off and say, Jesus, I want to hear you. And I want to fall in love with you rather than in hated at the world. Tuesday's a pretty incredible day. We should spend Monday, today and Monday, praying for Tuesday and what's gonna happen and that God would move in the hearts of the people, but it needs to move in my heart first. Maybe I need to do some fasting. Fasting is when I decide I'm gonna take some time away from the world and I wanna spend time with God. The things that I love, whether it's food or the, my hobby that I love, or maybe it's social media, Maybe it's those things that have gotten in the way of Jesus. Maybe it's my love for home decorating. Maybe it's my pursuit of sports. My love for all those things is greater than God. And I say, God, I'm going to stop, step away from that because I want to learn to love you more. Maybe so I just need to start serving. I don't feel like it. I don't want to. I'm tired. I've done my part. But we just need to come back and say, God, I will do what you asked me to do. And I'll, I'll get in there and I'll work with these wonderful middle schoolers and I'll serve the people who are hurting. Maybe it's your work. You're going to persevere and you're going to demonstrate love instead of fighting. But you say, God, I want to chip away on the things that have separated me from me because I want to walk with you. That's that repenting. That's that turning around. 
Say, God, would you restore my heart to where it needs to be? Are we going to walk towards Jesus? Verse 5, whole thing, let's read from the beginning. It says, Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So he's saying to the church, if you don't come back to loving me like you should, then I'm going to remove you. I'm taking away the light because you're not holding it anymore. Churches come and go in the United States. The average lifespan of a church is 40 years. Some of them have been around a long, 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 long time. That means some of them don't last very long at all. First generation, boy, they're serving. The next ones kind of drift and they change. And when you stop loving Jesus in a church, you stop being the church. And he says, if you don't turn this around, there's gonna be a a loss. Verse six, he says, but you have this in your favor. You, ha- you hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans, we're going to learn more about them in the letter to Pergamum. They're a group that taught false doctrine. He says, I've got this for you. At least you're not doing that false teaching. You're doing that right. And then verse 7, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So he's got this incredible reward and reward, a reward that is immeasurable. And he says, you stay faithful. Keep your heart right. Get rid of this stuff. Repent. Come back to me. Don't look like the world. Don't hate. Don't retaliate like the world. You live differently. You live like Jimmy. You spend time with me so your heart can shine again. And your, our love for Jesus is one that I just, I love him so much. And now I can love people because my overflow of my love for Jesus overflows into people. Instead of being so angry and mad at people, now I'm able to love them, even the people who are so messed up because Jesus loves them. And that only comes when I love Jesus like I should. And he says, the reward, it's gonna be immeasurable. That paradise, the tree tree of life, we see in the book of Genesis. We also see it in Revelation 21. We get to heaven, we're going to be eat from this tree. And he says the reward is going to be greater than you can ever imagine, so persevere and hang on. But that reward also happens now in this relationship with him that's giving life to your heart, to your soul. And we need to be restored. So tired of the world. Instead of just falling under the hatred and bitterness of the world, can we say, God, Help me to get rid of this. Help me to be in love with you as I was before. Would you pray with me? God, you're walking amongst us no matter where we're at, and you know our hearts. And we repent. We ask you to help us intentionally walk towards you and chip away the stuff that's been a distraction. The stuff that we've, we've built idols in our life and we, we love these things and more than you. And sometimes we love the negative and the hatred more than you. We're more passionate about things of politics and sports and world than we are passionate about you. And I pray that you'd forgive us I pray that you'd speak to us today. And Father, we would hear you and reveal to us those steps we need to take back towards you. We would do what we need to do. Would you restore our hearts, restore our love, help us to continue to persevere. And God, I pray that this week would be an opportunity for everybody that's listening to you and your word to hold your light bright. Father, help us to think of you every day and we'd hear your words in our lives. In Jesus, I pray.